Hello everyone, welcome back. This is Mobin. So we will be continuing today with the immunology questions which we were doing. Uh, today's question is very interesting. This is question number 10 and I believe we have covered most of this as part of our previous lectures. So let's very quickly see what is the question and then see how to answer this particular question. All right, ready? So let's go to the uh, question itself. So the question is that there is a 29 year old nurse who is exposed to a patient with active tuberculosis. She presents with a chest x-ray showing a small calcification. She is otherwise asymptomatic. So you got a patient, so here is the story. You got a patient, uh, she's a, a medical professional, comes to you, has been exposed to an active uh, patient with an active tuberculosis, coming to you asymptomatic but does have something showing up on the chest x-ray. Now the question here is, which of the following cell combination is the major contributor to contain this infection? So really the, the, the question is asking that what cells are responsible to limit the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection or TB infection? So the, the options here, number A, dendritic cells and B lymphocytes, a combination of these two cells or partnership of these two cells, natural killer cells with CD8 T lymphocytes. So that is the um, B option. Uh, CD4 T lymphocytes with macrophages and CD4 lymphocytes with B lymphocytes. And I, I would just clarify here, so again from your point of view of attempting the question, I'm sure that you know CD8 T lymphocytes are cytotoxic T lymphocytes and CD4 T lymphocytes could be naive T lymphocytes or T helper 1 lymphocytes or T helper 2 lymphocytes depends upon their uh, remaining uh, characteristics. So here these are the various partnering cells which will work with each other and contain the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection or TB infection or tuberculosis infection. So which combination is the most uh, prone to, to contain this infection, to eradicate this infection? So let's start discussing this and see uh, uh, how, w how we should attempt this question. So to answer this question before we go about answering it, I want to once again uh, recap some of the TB related uh, uh, concepts to, to see. So let's start here. Let us say, first of all, let's say a person is, is exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? So that exposure, of course, the inhalation of the respiratory droplets from a patient came in and you, you know that these droplets are usually one to two micrometer micrometer in size. The droplets which are smaller, bigger than that are usually trapped into the nasopharyngeal pathways, they are trapped in the bronchial pathways and they do not really end up deeper in the, so let's say if this is the bronchial tree and you know that it keeps dividing in a binary fashion and then finally there are alveoli and alveoli are then uh, lined by the uh, type 2 cells and, um, and other, you know, cells. Of course, the most important here, the alveolar macrophages here. So we know that that happens, but the important thing to understand is that the bigger particles are trapped somewhere before the alveoli. This area, starting from the nas nasopharyngeal area all the way down, these particles are bigger particles are trapped. The smaller particles, so those little droplets coming from the breathing of the patient has, those droplets have mycobacterium, this bacillus riding on them and coming in and it's going to go in. Now there is a very interesting question here. The question is why does that bacterium not infect the passages on the way and why especially the, the alveolus area, why is that more prone to the infection? The important thing to note here is that most of the bronchial epithelial cells, they actually, number one, of course, you know that we have a mucociliary uh, elevator or escalator which brings the secretions out. So these, these epithelia here, they trap the foreign substances and they, they help us throw them out. But at the same time, the latest researches are telling that these cells actually release 
chemical substances to neutralize the infections as well. So we would just call it at this time that this area is very resistant to the infections from mycobacterium um, uh, tuberculosis and actually very resistant to many other infections. On the other hand, the alveoli are really uh, prone to these infections. These are single, mostly single celled uh, sacs and these are easy to be penetrated and easy to be attacked. So the first thing which we needed to understand is that the mycobacterium tuberculosis is going to enter the body through the inhalation. So that is one. Second thing which we should know, and we also answered the question that why, why not the bronchial tree? So bronchial tree is resistant. Now the second thing which we should know is that once inside the alveolus, what happens? So let's say we, we make in an alveolar macrophage. So this is an alveolar alveolar macrophage. Now you know that the macrophages have gotten various kind of receptors like doll like receptors and other com complement receptors. So those receptors are present and they're going to help trap the bacteria and move it inside. So what are the receptors which do this? And before we go to the receptors you should know that as the bacillus has come here, so this area, this thing is really inside, so let's say if this is the lungs um, here and finally there is one alveolus. So we are looking at a view from this area. We are looking at a view of the alveolus. So here is the cell here which is presented here and the bacillus is sitting beside that. So the very first thing which happens is that of course you know that the bacillus would become coated with complement um, proteins. Right? So that is a normal uh, process and that is the process of the uh, innate uh, immune reaction that there are complement proteins and these get activated and so, so now we have gotten some complement substances attached to the bacteria. This bacteria also, please remember this, this is very important. This bacteria also has on its surface the, the LAM, L-A-M. Lipoarabino manan or manan. Lipoarabino manan. I sort of capitalize the letters which can help you understand it. Lipoarabino manan, it's a glycoprotein. It's a glycoprotein. And this is one of the major, major virulent fact factor for mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is a major virulent factor. You'll see in today's lecture, you would see how much this virulent factor or how much LAM contributes to the host and the mycobacterium interaction and to the disease and, and, and to the actually containment of the disease. So now just remember that we've got a LAM attached to the mycobacterium surface. These LAMs are actually capped by mannose. Um, of course, you're seeing here lipo, arabino, manan. So those manones, manones are capping it. So anyways, uh, that's not the primary discussion today. But just know that the bacteria now, when it is approaching a macrophage, that bacteria has already become coated with the complement and it has gotten its own LAM surface uh, glycoproteins, sorry, glycolipids. Uh, Why did I write proteins here? So glycolipids, its own li glycolipids. And these are now going to play some role. So the role is what? Bacteria is here, alveolar macrophage is here. This macrophage is actually an inactive macrophage. What does that mean? This, this macrophage is just sitting around there, twiddling its thumb, waiting for something to come in and so it can start fighting with it. Now this macrophage is expressing complement receptor 1, three and four. It is expressing many other receptors, but in this particular context, the most important thing to understand is that the macrophage is expressing the complement receptor one, three, and four. These receptors, complement receptor one, three, and four. These receptors are very important because these are the ones which are going to, number one, um, work with the complement uh, coated here, so C3B uh, fragments, and with the LAM. So this connection here, when the complement which is sitting, so I hope you understand that on the bacterial surface, so let's say this is the bacterial surface, C3 complement 
uh, protein which comes here becomes C3B and then it has a conformational change in it in almost like a suction cup. Have you seen a suction cup which goes against let's say glass or something and it just holds on to it. Just like a suction cup the C3B conformational change attaches the complement on the surface of the bacteria. It's not going to tear off from there. So that surface uh, is present here and the complement proteins are there. These then interact with the CR1 complement receptor 1, 3 and 4. There are other receptors which are also uh, important here. There is mannose receptors on the surface. So let's say this is a mannose receptors receptor. These receptors also work with this LAM. So if I make the LAM here, mannose receptors working with LAM. Then there are scavenger receptors, scavenger receptors and later studies are saying that the scavenger receptors are also actually very important in um, in trapping the mycobacterium and, and phagocytosing it. They actually found out in one of the studies that if you knock off the complement receptors and the mannose receptors and just leave the scavenger receptors, still about 40% of the bacterial population will become internalized or phagocytosed. So they, they have a major uh, factor here, 40% is a lot. So anyways, or 40% or more I believe. So now what happens is once the bacteria is here, the bacteria has become phagocytosed via these uh, receptor interactions. So I can make a little bacteria here. So let me just quickly make my macrophage a little bit bigger so we can, we can actually have a, so let's say this is our macrophage and the phago, phagosome is present here and the bacteria is sitting in there. It's quite a happy bacteria as we have done in our previous discussions that when bacteria go into this beautiful, beautiful, fun place, um, they feel that this is a hot tub and they're sitting in it and they're having fun. They do not know that this is a trap and ultimately they're going to get um, in trouble. But for the time being in this vacuole, in this phagosome, phagosome, the bacteria are sitting in there and having fun. Now what happens is, once the, once the phagosomes come into the um, cell, we know that the cell machinery starts working and what happens is that the lysosomes, lysosomes which are sitting on the side, these become activated and they come and they become fused, making the phago, phago lysosome. We know this as well. The important thing is that now, here is something which is really important. So once the phagolysosome is formed, that combined um, vacuole is formed and I've covered this in my previous lecture. So please uh, check out the uh, YouTube videos. But once that is form, found, the ideal situation now is that the reactive oxygen species, reactive oxygen species or intermediates and reactive nitrogen intermediates intermediates for example NO is one of the most important one NO these are poured over to the bacteria and ideally bacteria is killed as a result of that now there is one more very very important thing to notice if somebody asks you for the mycobacterium tuberculosis is it the reactive oxygen species which is more important or reactive nitrogen species which is more important? In, in this particular case, your answer is going to be reactive nitrogen species. So the, for the mycobacterium tuberculosis, the most important phenomena of killing that is nitrogen species instead of oxygen species. So many patients who do not have good oxygen species are still able to kill the uh, mycobacterium. So, now that is the normal process. What would happen is the bacteria would then be diced and sliced and beaten up and, and fragmented and I think you know that. Then these frag fragments will be recycled on MIC2 and these will be then presented outside here. So let's say this is the MHC2 um, with, the, with the fragments of the bacteria showing on it. 
right? So we we've, we've talked about it in the past, and we have not seen the molecular structure of MIC2U, uh, sorry, MIC2 or MIC1, and I would be covering that later. But this is really how the antigen presentation starts working. Now, one thing which is important is to remember antigen presenting cells. Primarily, we have gotten the macrophages, we have dendritic cells, and we have gotten the um, uh, what is that? There is another uh, cells neutrophils. So there, there are antigen presenting cells. Actually, this is very important that all cells of the body can also be called to be antigen presenting cells except the nucleated, uh, enucleated cells, for example, RBCs. Antigen presented on MHC1 is a capability of all cells, but M antigen presented on MHC2 is not a capability of every cell. And in that case, we've gotten the uh, monocytes, macrophages, and um, the dendritic cells. Anyways, so now the antigen is presented outside. That antigen presentation will do what? In addition to the antigen presentation, there is one more thing which is happening. And what is that? That is that this macrophage is now um, secreting interleukin-12. The macrophage is now secreting interleukin-12. So be very careful. Now we are coming to the answer here that what cellular combinations, what cellular partnership will take care of the containment of this bacteria. So remember this bacteria is just in this macrophage, but there are so many other bacteria which are moving around having fun and we need to take care of them, right? So this interleukin-12 which is expressed is going to go and activate what? It would act on, it would act on T helper zero cell. Remember the T cells? T cells? So it would work on T helper zero cell. So I want to make its eyes so you can see. And here it is. So it would pick up a naive T helper cell and convert that T helper cell into T helper one cell. So remember, this is CD4. T helper cells are CD4. CD4. Remember, CD4s interact with MHC2. The MHC and the the CD number when we multiply them, that is the way to remember it, when we multiply them, the answer is 8. So 4 always works with 2, so 4 multiplied by 2 is 8, and 1 always, MHC1 always uh, works with CD8, which, which is the multiplication is also 8. So anyways, the CD4 cell here, the, um, the helper, naive helper cell, when that cell is, when that cell receives interleukin-12, it converts into T helper 1 cell. Now T helper 1 cell now has a mission. Well, it looks a little sad, but it does have a mission. It knows what it is going to do. So what is happening is now this guy is going to secrete two things, interleukin 8, sorry, interleukin 2, and interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is released, and interleukin 2 is, in, is released. Interleukin 2 in turn activates the cytotoxic uh, cells, cytotoxic, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which are CD8. So this is how they, they can help you become confused that now all of a sudden you know that the this pathway is also going to go towards the CD8, but that is something which is not important at this time. What is important is that T helper 1 has become active and it has activated the cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CD8 cells and so this is what is important. Here is a partnership and this interferon gamma acts on the macrophage and activates the macrophage. This interferon gamma, so let's say it is a box, so this box molecule comes and activates the macrophage. Okay, so now what do we mean by activation of the macrophage? The activation of the macrophage means that inside the macrophage, there are two, three changes which appear. What are those changes? So remember this, write it down somewhere, activation of macrophage means what? Number one, number one, activation of macrophage means what? Number one, Receptor expression is reduced, not increased, reduced. Why? Do you want this, this macrophage to become busy in killing the cells, the bacterias, or do you want it to keep trapping more 
you want it to be doing both things. So it already has so many receptors here which are trapping the bacteria, but we want its internal machinery to become active to start killing the bacteria now. So it has an additional function. So one of the function is reduced and that is the receptor expression. So intake of more bacteria would reduce, but killing of the bacteria would increase. So that is one. So receptor expression is reduced, especially the mannose receptors. Second thing which happens here is that the reactive oxygen species or reactive oxygen intermediates are increased. So superoxides and hydrogen peroxide and those kind of things are increased. Number three, reactive nitrogen species or reactive nitrogen intermediates are increased. And of course, we established a few minutes back that in the case of mycobacterium tuberculosis, the more important species which kills the mycobacterium is reactive nitrogen species as compared to reactive oxygen species. So reactive nitrogen species is present there as well. Then in addition to that, there are more proteins which are making the more lysosomes and, and helping with the fusion of the phagosome, lysosome and that. But this is the primary uh, function here. Plus, of course, the secretions from the macrophage, secretions also increase. And we'll talk about it. So the, the, the substances released from the macrophage would increase. The end result of this activation is what? The mycobacterium is going to die. So now the, the phagocyte is going to start acting more on the micro, mycobacterium and it is going to start killing it. So that is the activation of the macrophage. So that is one function which this thing, T, T helper cell, one did. So this IL-12 interferon gamma interaction, this particular uh, axis is very important to understand. Do you know that if they ask you this question that, hey, what happens if, if a patient is infected with mycobacterium, but instead of defeating the infection, the patient became lepromatous? What happens? So let's talk about that very quickly for a second. So here is what is very important. You know this thing that when the pathogen comes, there are two pathways to take care of the pathogen. One pathway is to go from IL-12 to T helper 1 to cytotoxic T cells. So that is the cellular response to the, um, to the infective agent pathogen. There is another pathway which is IL-4, T helper 1, T helper 2 actually, why did I say 1, and then B cells. And this is humoral response. This is the antibiotics, antibodies which are released here. So that is humoral response. So body can take one of the two paths to respond to a pathogen which has come in. And I've discussed that in the past in the other lectures. So here, in this particular case, the important thing is that the path to be chosen should be towards the cellular response instead of the humoral response. The patients who actually receive, who actually become diseased with lepromatous lep leprosy, the reason in them, the genetic balance issue in them is that instead of reacting via the cellular pathway, they actually, instead of going to T helper 1, the naive cell goes to T helper 2 path and the T helper 2 would then go to the, um, uh, T helper 2 would this would go to T helper 2, then T helper 2 would go to the B cell pathway and that is a uh, humoral response. And mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis does not get killed with antibodies. So this needs this response. So if somebody developed lepromatous leprosy, what is the reason that he did it? Because his body made a genetic error and the programming in his cells is such that he responds with humoral responses instead of the cellular responses and that is a problem. This is a similar behavior in the Crohn's disease, in the asthma, in the organ transplant problems. The, these are bodies incorrect pathways followed. So again remember there are two pathways. One is a cellular pathway and the other one is the, um, the uh, humoral pathway and some pathogens are contained with the humoral and the other are contained with the cellular and you should know that. Especially in case of mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis kills one third of the world, uh, um, is responsible for one third of the deaths due to infections in adults in the world. It's a huge uh, issue and I think about, um, I don't know, um, I think 
30 to 40 percent of the world's population has the mycobacterium tuberculosis infections. So anyways, that is what is happening here. So now the question is which two cells are participating and working with each other? The cells which are participating are T helper 1, which is CD4, and uh, macrophage. So if you see at the, uh, on the TV on the question, you would see that there is one, one such option. So we, we are good with that one option. The one more question which we have is how does the bacteria itself, what, how does it trigger the uh, creation of a granuloma? So l let me just very quickly touch on that. So this mycobacterium, do not forget this. I had to go through, I don't know how many books and how many theses and how many papers to go and collect those things. Maybe I'm, I'm silly, I should know some book where it is just present in one place, but it is not. So please write it down that when a mycobacterium comes into our body, it has this lipoarabino mannan protein or lamb. What is the function of this mycobacterium now? What does it do to try to number one evade the pathogen and number two what kind of secretions and what things does it trigger? So very very important. So let me very quickly tell the very first thing that the mycobacterium when it comes into the body, it tries to evade this killing machine here, the phagolysosome. So how does it do it? It does that by releasing number one, sulfatides. It does that by releasing sulfatides and other such chemical substances and other chemical substances which neutralize, for example, one other very important chemical substance, I'll put that here, NH4, ammonia. It release, releases ammonia, it releases sulfatides, other substances which actually make this environment alkaline. They make this environment alkaline. They neutralize the acidity of the environment and so the, the, the mycobacterium will not be killed. So that is one. Then the mycobacterium when it cannot be killed, it comes out, jumps out and is inside the macrophage now and it's going to start replicating here and soon burst open the macrophage. So that is one thing which it does. The second thing which the lamb interaction, lamb and the host interaction, what that does is which is very very important is an increased expression of ICAM, intracellular adhesion molecules, ICAM1. This increased expression of ICAM1 would cause the cells to start aggregating with each other, start bonding with each other. That is how the granuloma walls start forming. That is how various macrophages start attaching to each other and eventually they merge to make the giant cells and the Langhan cells. So ICAM1 expression is increased. Of course sulfatides are released. Of course ammonia is released. Then lamb or the mycobacterium and the lamb, the, the cell surface protein here, also causes the, the macrophage to release increase the release of interleukin-8. Interleukin-8 will go and activate, it's a chemotactic factor, plus it would activate the other, uh, other cells. Then it increases interleukin-12, which you know, if you see here, the interleukin-12, this release here, that would actually amplify the function that would actually convert other T helper cells to T helper 1, which would in turn send more alpha uh, interferon gamma, which would in turn activate the macrophage again. So this pathway keeps becoming amplified because the macrophage is activating helper cells and helper cells are activating the macrophage. So increase interleukin-12 would of course mean that there would be activation of the macrophage. Then there is another increment and that is the tumor necrosis factor alpha becomes increased. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha starts becoming increased and you know that the granulomas are caseated in the middle. So this has something to do with that. Tumor necrosis factor alpha is actually a protein of the inflammation and one function of this is that it causes the uh, lysis of the uh, tissue. One more thing which is very interesting is that the in the granulomas, the monocytes and the and the macrophages and the neutrophils which come over, they actually induce apoptosis in these cells. Even this interleukin-8, one function of the interleukin-8 is to trigger the apoptosis of the cells. So what happens is that the macrophages start dying. Why, why would that be useful? Because when a cell is dead, that would not offer the mycobacterium a safe house to live in and the mycobacterium will be uh, killed. You know that when a cell becomes dead, there is 
uh, influx of calcium and that is why the calcifications appear uh, in case of the microbacterial uh, infections. So that is why you should mm, please do remember that IL-8 causes apoptosis. The monocytes which are coming in this place, the neutrophils which come in this place and the cytotoxic T cells. So this is a very important thing. The cytotoxic T cells usually do not have much to contribute into the granuloma formation or into the containment of the TB uh, microbacterium tuberculosis into the containment of this bacillus, but they do kill the macrophages which are infected. That is a very interesting thing. So they can actually eat up the macrophages which are there. So other macrophages would eat up the uh, these uh, infected macrophages. The neutrophils would eat up these infected macrophages. The cytotoxic T cells would eat up these. Uh, infected macrophages. So these are some of the things which are uh, released. Then there is an increased release, do not forget this, of gelatinase and collagenase. And these are actually triggered by the, uh, by the lamb. So the lamb which is attached, these lamb surface virulent factors, this glycolipid that causes this all, these all substances to be released from inside the macrophage. So ultimately what happens is that when this whole process works, there is a granuloma which is formed, there is infection which is contained. How did the infection contain? Because the macrophage died. Mycobacterium tried to get away. How did it try to get away? If somebody asks you what is it, the question is how would the mycobacterium try to get out? Well, the mycobacterium would try to get out by releasing sulfatides and ammonia and other substances which reduce the reactive nitrogen species and reactive oxygen species. Uh, the macrophage cannot kill the bacteria anymore. Bacteria would replicate and, and become a winner. But at the end of the day, there are so many other controlling factors which would come and uh, take care of this. What are the controlling factors? So how, how does a granuloma form? Now within two to three days you would see increased neutrophils presence that is chemo attractants coming from IL-8, coming from the other uh, interferon gammas and other substances and the tissue breakdown substances which are present here. Then come the monocyte. So within two to three days you see a lot of mono, monocytes and the neutrophils. You would also see that the monocytes are now converting into mature macrophages. You would see some within five to seven days you would start seeing some mature macrophages there and some um, immature epithelioid cells. Then you would see that the epithelioid cells and the macrophages have started secreting the extracellular protein matrix, for example, fibronectins or the osteopontin, and these are going to be the extracellular matrix, and so the granuloma or the walling off is occurring. ICAM-1 is increased as we established here, and that causes the cells to start bonding with each other, and big, large, gi giant st cells start forming. Then the fibroblasts are created, and uh, so there is, a, there is a granuloma which starts forming. The central portion of the granuloma is caseated and that caseation is because of tumor necrosis factor alpha plus because of the secretions of gelatinase and collagenase which are present and these sort of start causing the lysis in the center of the granuloma. The peripheral part of the granuloma still has the neutrophils and the fibroblasts and the, and the monocytes and those rims are present uh, on the side. So that is what really is happening in this particular uh, situation. Now, what is the what is the answer though? So, if we go back to the TV for a second and we see what is the answer, the answer is going to be. So, I cannot uh, apparently go back to the TV at the moment, but the um, answer is uh, if I read it, dendritic cells and B lymphocytes are one. So the uh, they, they have nothing to do here. Dendritic cells are antigen presenting cells. B lymphocyte is a response to the humoral and of course we, uh, we actually know that mycobacterium if body responds with the humoral response then the person is actually going to become uh, much worse and develop leprosy. Uh, the other question the B part was natural killer cells with CD8 T lymphocytes. So natural killer cells and CD8 T lymphocytes. So the T lymphocytes here with the natural killer cells are really not, they are actually, natural killer cell is part of the uh, innate system, uh, T lymphocyte, cytotoxic T lymphocyte is part of the acquired system. They do not interact together to create this, uh, create any um, fix. And then the, so B, uh, A is incorrect. 
B is incorrect. C, CD4 T lymphocytes with macrophages. That is what we are just seeing. Macrophage combined with the CD4 T lymphocyte working together to create, not only to contain this infection, but also wall off and create granuloma and actually try to kill the infections in there and contain it. The patients who cannot form granulomas, in, and for example, if they have a bad ICAM um, gene, or we have experimentally knocked off in the mice the ICAM gene or other uh, gelatinase or collagenase type substance receptors, then the mycobacterium uh, goes out into the body and causes more damage. So uh, that, that, is, that seems to be a true answer. Let's see the fourth answer as well, CD4 T lymphocytes with B lymphocytes. So again, CD4 T lymphocytes, that is the helper working with the B lymphocyte is also a B lymphocyte or humoral pathway of immune reaction, which is actually not a uh, correct uh, answer. The correct answer is cytotoxic. Uh, correct answer is macrophages working with the CD4 helper cells. So thank you very much and I would see you again.